Hello. Uh, thanks a lot, Rich, for inviting me. It's always a great time to be in Iowa City. So we are going to talk about drug trials and medications for tinnitus treatment. How many of you are patients? How many of you have tinnitus? So I'm trying to find a pattern <laughs> to see why we get into this field. And I think one of the reasons is some of us have it. So in a recent um, paper published by Rich, he interviewed people, tinnitus patients, in a group in Australia. Correct me, Rich, if I'm not right. So among all treatments, 52% of the patients would take pills to reduce tinnitus by half and to reduce it completely 62%. So although a lot of people want medication to treat tinnitus, you can see that some don't. And it happens quite frequent at the office. So they are, they don't like to take medical medicine or their tinnitus is not that bad. They want to take the risk to have an adverse effect from medication. So what's the best drug to treat tinnitus? Do you remember where you were in 1990s? Well, I do remember where I was. The love of my life was born. My little girl, Marina, now she's 23 years old. But in the tinnitus field, um, there was a review of, uh, published by Rich and, and his group, where, and also by Dobie in 1999, where they found out some promising medications they figured out that there were some research design shortcomings, and they suggested new strategies for improved future clinical trials. You can see also, we have a, a, um, a review here in this reference. So sometimes time passes, and we don't realize it passes so fast. Uh, yesterday morning, while I was waiting my connection in Miami, uh, well, I decided, I think I should rent a car. So I went to all of those rental car sites, and I was trying to find a good deal. And suddenly one says this, well, we have a special, a special offer if you're 50 years older. And I saw this couple, white hair. Then I said, oh, too bad I don't apply for that. And then 15 minutes later, I realized, my God, I'm 52. I apply for that. <laughs> so I got the car, and I had a very good, but very good deal on that. So more than two decades later, the same thing. Sometimes we, th we think time doesn't pass, but it passed. The, situ the situation is the same. Despite the considerable numbers of drugs evaluated on clinical trials, none has been replicate, replicable, uh, replicable sorry, long-term reduction in most of the patients with a superior effect than placebo. So although there is still lack of evidence to justify the routine use of medications in the management of tinnitus, Patients and physicians seek mitigation for the symptoms and its associated stress. This is the reality in our office every day. Over 4 million of labels prescriptions from a wide variety of drugs are written each year for tinnitus relief, possibly with considerable adverse effects. So there it is, our patient which option, what should we do, which, which way should we take? So first of all, considering that, that I just said, there is no FDA-approved drug to treat tinnitus. 
But we must have in mind that tinnitus is a symptom, so there's a lot of causes and associated causes. Sometimes the tinnitus has different causes in the same patient. There are different etiologies and mechanisms. And of course, there are subgroups of tinnitus patients. And it's so complex. If you can imagine, first of all, the environment factors of each patient, their brain network, their genetic basis, and if you go, so what chemicals are involved in the generation of tinnitus and its reaction? It's not a simple thing to treat with, let me see, one, let's say, one medication. We must be very lucky to find, and I think when a patient has a good result, that's fantastic. But it's not regular, but it happens. So tinnitus is like a fingerprint for each patient. It's unique. So in my whole time in clinical practice, I'm reading this book from Michael Gladwell. Uh, I don't know if you know him. He's a writer in The New Yorker. Uh, it's called The Outliers. And he says that to be an expert in something, you need 10,000 hours of experience. And I would say I've been in the tinnitus field for quite a while, and I think there's still a lot of things that I have to learn, and I do it every day with my patients. So I've never seen a patient like the other. So it's unique. So what did Rich and Dolby found before? In the tinnitus studies, there was a lack of placebo-controlled and double-blind design, the use of inadequate outcome measurements, and short duration of the trial. I, I, I'm sure Rich is going to talk about measurements, tinnitus measurements later. And there was also a lack of follow-up periods or large dropout rates. So, and then a little bit more considering herbs and nutritional supplements. Uh, one thing we have to say that label natural does not mean safety. The FDA does not inspect or regulate natural remedies the way they do for prescription drugs. And there are different degrees of purity, strand effect, and the supplements might be contaminated. So we have to take that into account as well on, in all those trials that have been trying supplements. Recently, the American Academy of Otolaryngology developed the clinical practice guideline to tinnitus, which its objective was to recommend to guide the evaluation and measurements of the effect of tinnitus and to determine the most appropriate interventions to improve symptoms and quality of life on tinnitus sufferers. So, what do we have for medications? So, they were considered, these interventions that I'm going to talk, but there were no recommendations for it or against it. So, medical therapy, all these classes of drugs, antidepressants, anticonvulsants, anxiolytics, and intratympanic medication, and dietary supplements, ginkgo, melatonin, and zinc. So how should we think of what can we pick up from all what has been said? We have to have evidence-based rational for the treatment, and identification of tinnitus subgroups and comorbidities. comorbidities. So there are two points on treatment. One goes straight to treat the tinnitus magnitude, which would be the loudness of tinnitus. And the other branch of treatment, or together with that at the same point, is to control and to reduce the tinnitus reactions, which would be emotional, hearing, concentration, and sleep. 
So in specific cases, let's see we have a patient with vascular insufficiency and senility. We could try EGB or pentoxifilin that would increase the blood circulation. In a patient with many heart er disease, we could go for betastine. Lots of them, lots of patients have depression or anxiety associated with the tinnitus. So we don't know which one comes first, if they are from the same uh, brain network, the same chemicals, neurotransmitters are involved in tinnitus uh, and anxiety or depression. Uh, we cannot know, but if it's there, we have to treat it. So there's a lot of treatments that have been tested on tinnitus patients. And it gets in the same point. The clinical trial has not been, we can say that it really works. It might work for some patients. So trazodone, paroxetine, and sertraline, nortriptyline, amtriptyline, and chimipramine, clonazepam, alprazolam, and empirical, escitalopram and passiflorin carnata. This one has been well demonstrated by Dr. Levine, which is migraine typewriter tinnitus, a good effect. In this case, there is a vascular compression of the eighth nerve. Carbamazepine seems to work quite well, and I have a very good experience on my clinical practice. The diagnosis of this vascular compression is a little bit tricky because what we have in mind is we are looking for a pulsatile tinnitus, but I would say most of my cases it's not. So if you have a good radiologist, he's going to find the pressure of the, the artery over the nerve, and it makes a huge difference. We need a radiologist to do this diagnosis. For Subjects with acoustic trauma and normal hearing, gabapentin has a lot of bases, and it works for some patients. Uh, one of the most frequent comorbidities are sleep problems. So we have a whole bunch of uh, choices here. And melatonin, actually, we're going to, to have published at the end. It has just been accepted a paper where we evaluate in a web-based uh, research. They use what's the patient's impression on supplements use. So the best supplement that we found to treat tinnitus reaction was melatonin. Patients with sleep disorders had a Cohen D1 of 1.21, which is a huge effect. Clonazepam, trazodone, and zolpidin are also might be used. And when hyperacusis is together, tinnitus is complicated, but tinnitus plus hyperacusis is, can be a really mess. So what we have to treat, there's no clinical trials on medications to hyperacusis. There are some reports of a few cases that included the use of carbamazepine, fluoxetine, alprazolam, and citalopram. The last one is empirical. I have quite a good experience with this one in clinical practice. It really helps hyperacusis. In the case of vitamin and blood deficiencies, the best way is to make the diagnosis using blood tests. If the blood test is not normal, the value is not normal, or it's near the normal, the normality levels, you could, for these patients, make a supplement. So for B12, one milligram per day for four months, and zinc, I would say zincalate, zinc element of 50 milligrams, there's a lot of different things that uh, we, different ways to prepare zinc. I would say if the patient is deficient, not to everyone. So this is one, uh, I, I like very much this trial. It was done here at the University of Iowa. 
and it was about uh, zinc and placebo. I just want to show you this in this. Oh, I hope it shows here. Uh, I put this, I don't want to go into the, the, this trial results, but I want to show you here this quadrant where zinc takes no effect and placebo takes effect. So there's a lot of patients that have an effect with placebo. So evidences or lack of evidence. There's a lot of trials that have to be duplicated, that they have preliminary good results, but we cannot say it worked for all patients. Oh, this one is one of my favorite treatments, cyclobenzaprine. This trial was done with the TRI group, a pharma group. We tested five different uh, um, ways. We had five different trials, so uh, all with muscle relaxants. One's, uh, one was orphanodrine, uh, tizanidine, epiridone, and cyclobenzaprine in two doses. So this one with, was a low dosage, less than 10 milligrams, and this one was with 30 milligrams. You can see it was the only drug that had an effect, and I could say it has an effect on loudness as well. But it has to be duplicated. It works for some patients. We don't know which ones are. So all these drugs have still to be uh, replicate, replicated. So if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, I got this map. This is what's going on on tinnitus research for medications at this moment. So there are some trials going on. And these are the drugs that are being tested. Uh, there are two local anesthetic, anesthetic trials. One is with lidocaine patch. And the other one, uh, the amlacrine, if any one of you have ever done a local skin surgery or Botox, <laughs> they use it. So they are using it in a trial to treat trinitus. And the AM101, is, there's a lot of publications on it, and so on. So conclusions. There's still no established treatment for drugs, unlikely to have one single drug to treat all forms of tinnitus. Subtypes of tinnitus will require a different form of treatment, and some subjects benefit from drugs and supplements. I like this very much. Good doctors use both individual clinical expertise and the best available external evidence, which would be clinical trials. And neither alone is enough. Without clinical expertise, practice risks becoming a tyrannizing external evidence. For even excellent external evidence, there may be inapplicable or inappropriate for an individual patient. As we were talking before, the fingerprint of tinnitus. And without current best external evidence, practice risk becoming rapidly out of date to, in the detriment of, to the detriment of patients. So last year when we were coming here, Italo, a friend, he was a speaker here, and we had this huge storm. I don't know if you were, some of you were here. So we were in an auto meeting in Michigan and we were driving to Iowa. So we had to stop in, in uh, fuel and station. It was raining, and the cell phone started to scream, saying alarms. And I said, Italo, let's go to Iowa. I think there's light out there. So that's, that's what we had in the back, and that was in the mirror, and that's what we had in front, clear sky in Iowa City. And I hope the same thing goes to medication that we find a way, I wouldn't say just medication, I would say for tinnitus. We leave the black clouds behind and find a sunny sky ahead. So these are my babies right now. <laughs> I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep the Ziggy Stardust, which is the small one. He doesn't even have one pound and his brothers and sisters are huge now. So, thank you very much for your attention. This is my email. If you'd like to talk, I would be 
it will be an honor to have you tomorrow on the group's discussions. We will be talking about treatments, medical treatments and supplements. Whatever you would like to discuss would be a great time to talk in small groups. So if you have any questions, I would be glad to talk to you now as well.